Hello, my name is Brandon Lowe, and I'm your host of Squadron TV, and today we have the first episode of a new series of videos where our friends in the business tell their story of how they got started. And today I would like to introduce you to my friend Lauren Perry, who's going to tell you all about gold medal models. Thank you. Hey, Lauren, how are you doing? Doing just fine, Brandon. Great. Well, I appreciate you coming on here with me. This is uh, the first one of these that I've done. Uh, hopefully it'll go well. Uh, but I really just wanted to get you to tell us about gold medal. You just uh, decided that it's time to retire and uh, you wanted to see what you what was going to happen with the ship model products in your gold medal line. And we, of course, ended up buying that from you. I'm very happy to be able to continue the line, the, the name brand, everything that you've done. So tell us how you got started and, you know, just tell us a little bit about your story there. Well, in my early days, I was a ship model since I was a small boy. My father bought me a kit, a kit of the Lindbergh LST when I was a child. And uh, that to me was quite a thrill. Uh, the fact that that particular kit made you uh, assemble your own handrails around the edge of the deck using thread uh, set something off in me. And I really became detail oriented at that point. As I got older, I went through all the the uh, Revell plastic kits and some Lindbergh plastic kits and some Aurora kits. Loved them all, some more than others. And then as I became a young adult, of course, I joined the Navy at one point. I got into RC models at that time as a hobby. It started out as aircraft, but I still built a couple of uh, scale ship models. Almost all of them were from scratch. Then when I got out of the Navy, I went to work uh, as an aircraft mechanic. And uh, as I was... Uh, putting airplanes uh, together, taking them apart. I kept noticing interesting mechanisms on how they got certain controls to do to uh, do certain tricks to the flight surfaces, especially on uh, later on when I was messing around with Navy aircraft. I was always wondering how they got the flight surfaces to disconnect when they folded the wings and reconnect when they extended the wings without anybody doing anything to them. And when I figured that out, I filed that away in the back of my memory thinking one day, I can put a mechanism like that to work on a model ship. And sure enough, one day I did build a model ship that was able to use that, that uh, system and several others. I uh, uh, rejoined the Navy in the, in the version of a, uh, well, in the form of a reservist, an active duty reservist around uh, 1980 or so. Uh, actually, uh, I, I can't remember the exact year, but it was when Jimmy Carter was in office. And uh, the, re the reason I rejoined, I was working as an aircraft mechanic inside the hangar and this Navy captain in full dress uniform, walked out into the center of our hangar, leaned back, put his hands to his mouth like this and screamed out, anybody in this hangar want to join the Navy? And I'd just gotten out of the Navy for four years and I had to find out what this was all about. So I went over and introduced myself. Turned out he was commanding officer of Navy recruiting district, Jacksonville, Florida. And just to cut to the chase, I ended up uh, re-upping into the Naval Reserves and became a recruiter. Well, one of the things I did as a recruiter was to go to various high schools, shopping malls, trying to attract attention. And at this point, I decided to start building a model of the USS Long Beach that was radio control, something that I could attract attention with. It took two years to finish, but I was still in the Navy when I finished it. And when it was completed, it had all the weapon systems fully animated, had an onboard sound system using a then current eight track tape system. And uh, I rebuilt the uh, heath kit, which I assembled into the bridge of a ship. I really went all out. And it was a real hit at all, all of these Navy events. I got on local uh, news shows and so on and so forth on TV. And uh, the model really made me a recognizable figure over the over the area. This is in the southeastern United States. And then I heard about the IPMS through a friend of mine that I had met. And he said, you ought to take this thing to an IPMS show. So I did. I went to New York City. Uh, well, actually, before I did that, I went to an IPMS show in Atlanta. Uh, and there I met John Ficklin. John Ficklin at the time was one of the finest ship models the IPMS has ever had, probably one of the finest in the United States. Uh, he was an airline pilot for Eastern Airlines, and he had scratch-built a 
a model of the ship that bore the name of his hometown, the USS Atlanta. It was, it was a 1 192nd scale, making it about, oh, three feet long. Fiberglass hull, plastic superstructure, and many, many details made out of a, a material using a method I had never heard of before, but it almost seemed like, like a wizard had done it. It was a, it was a system called photo etching. I'd never heard of this before. And yet I've been to museums and I'd seen some professionally built models that apparently used that system to manufacture things like nets, gun sights, and so on. I always wondered how they did that. Well, here John was doing it, building machine guns that used hypodermic needles for gun barrels and uh, crosshairs in the gun sights. I had to find out how he did this. So I introduced myself to him he was very kind, very nice about it. And uh, he was surrounded by models all over the place, just wanting to know how he did this, how he did that. But he gave me the address of a company in Erieville, New York, called Photocut, spelled with an F, F-O-T-O. Photocut is, was sort of a job shop for hobbyists. You could send them the drawings of any photo etch product that you wanted them to make. They would convert it to a photographic negative and then use that as a photo tool to imprint the image on a sheet of chemically treated brass. And then they would submerge the brass in acid and anything that was protected by the image that you would imprint it on it was preserved and the acid would not touch it. All the other metal was dissolved away and it ended up leaving just the parts that you drew and uh, you could use those to finish your model. Well, I did as they said, sent them the drawings. A few weeks later, a big package arrived in the mail and it was all of these little parts I had designed. And it looked as though my drawing, which was done with pen and ink, had been magically transformed into brass. I could not believe my eyes. And so I peeled all the little parts off, assembled the model. And this model was a destroyer, the USS Vogel design. It was destroyer number 862. It was a modernized gearing class that I had seen in the flesh at Naval Station Mayport, Florida, when I was assigned there as a recruiter. And I uh, actually, I went aboard the ship next to it called the, uh, I believe it was called the Stein. And I asked permission to photograph the ship because I wanted to build a model of it. The uh, officer in charge says, I'm sorry, we can't do that. We've got classified material on board. And I said, all right, is it possible to cross over the gangplank to your next ship over here, which is tied up next to yours? And he said, certainly, you know, permission granted. So I did. The next ship was a carbon copy of the first ship. I introduced myself to that officer of the deck, told him the same thing. I wanted to build a model. Can I take photographs? He says, hell yes, you can take photographs. I'm a model builder myself. What else can I get you? Would you like a set of drawings of the ship? And he was the chief engineering officer. He went below decks, come back with a book of the general plans. And then uh, he gave me carte blanche to photograph anything I wanted. So I did. And this was the USS Vogel design. Well, I went home with that uh, treasure trove, found a fiberglass hull from a guy named Lee Upshaw out in Long Beach, California. He was running a company called Warship Hulls Unlimited. Ordered one of his hulls and then went from there. And uh, I made all the photo etched parts using the same technique I'd already described. This model I entered into the IPMS National Convention in uh, Atlanta, Georgia at the time. I think it was in the late 70s, but I just can't remember for sure. And anyway, that particular model won everything it was uh, capable of taking, everything it was classed for. Best ship, best in class, most popular, judges grand award. It took it all. And uh, just like John Fitland's ship had done several years prior. Well, John was just thrilled to death with this because he essentially had become my mentor and taught me what I uh, used on this model. And we became pretty close friends for a while. Well, then uh, I was operating this particular model in the water because what I didn't mention was this was also a radio control model. So I was operating the model in the water in Los Angeles at a, at a city park. And a man came up to me and looked it over. His name was Ed Bull. Ed Bull was a very well-known IPMS officer, an extremely talented 
aircraft model. Ed said, said to me, you know, this model stands a pretty good chance of uh, winning the model engineer exhibition in England. You ought to try that. And uh, so I did. Actually, I think he recommended that I try the the uh, the uh, the Phoenix IPMS show, which is what I've already described. I'm a little out of sequence here. Please forgive me after uh, 75 years of uh, on this earth here, my memory banks are getting a little mixed up. But anyway, I heard about the model engineer ex exhibition and uh, I took the model in a crate on a TWA 747 to England. I was in the Navy still at this time so I made a deal with my Navy bosses that I would represent the Navy in uniform and they in turn would foot the bill to send me to England. Now that's a deal I don't think you can get away with anymore. But did it, they did it for me because I was officially a Navy recruiter still and they felt this would be a good way to give the Navy uh, some fine publicity, especially if I won the thing. And so that went along flawlessly. I had a friend that I'd met and was corresponding with and they let me stay at their home and then I had a second friend that uh, kept me over for the second week because I was there for a total of two weeks and uh, that model ended up being the first American made scale model to win a gold medal at the model engineer exhibition uh, and I was up against some tough competition uh, it, it was really really astounding competition there so I was very happy with that I got to meet uh, the admiral in charge of the uh, British fleet, Sandy, I uh, can't remember his last name. Uh, he was in charge of the British fleet at the Battle of the Falkland Islands. And he was their guest of honor. So I got to meet him. And uh, I met a lot of fabulous people from Europe all over there. So the model got all the awards, or a award, the gold medal. And then uh, came back home with me on another TWA flight. And then... When I got home, a lot of my modeling friends kept asking me, can you make some stuff for me for my model using this photo etching te uh, technique? And I kept getting these questions and most of these guys were asking uh, about building parts for their plastic kits, not scratch build models. And this put an idea in my mind, I bet I can make a few little sets and sell them to hobbyists and maybe make enough money to make a car payment so I can buy a new car. This is exactly what I was thinking at the time. I was not thinking about turning it into a career. So I had, I was earning my, my uh, living elsewhere. So anyway, I took a chance, etched up about 25 sets each of 1350 scale New Jersey and 1350 scale Enterprise photo etch sets for the new Tamiya kits that had just been issued at that time. Sold them locally through a local hobby shop that was Brooke Curse Hobbies in Garden Grove, California. And so I took them over there and they took them in on consignment. And in two weeks, they sold every one. So then I got an order for more. They wanted more. So I had to come up with ways of uh, doing instruction sheets, packaging them. And I was trying to do it all on the cheap because I did not have an unlimited bankroll. I had to figure out a way to do this cheap. So I designed all the sets to be folded in half so they'd fit in an ordinary envelope, mailing envelope. It was actually slightly larger than a regular business envelope. It was a number 11 versus a number 10 business envelope. So I had a bunch of those made up, had some cardboard cut to fit so that it would protect the parts, and then uh, made up a rudimentary little price list. And uh, one thing uh, just blossomed into another. I decided to do sets for the rest of the Tamiya line, the Bismarck, the King George, the Prince of Wales, the Tirpitz, and uh, the Missouri, World War II. And every one of them was successful. They all sold. So now I'm starting to make a little money. And I decided, I think I'm going to invest some of this money I'm making into expanding the set. So I tried my hand at 1700 scale. And then I came out with a set for the 1350 Titanic and the Titanic set ultimately turned out the best-selling set I'd ever created, especially after 1996 when the uh, movie came out. And then I could not keep that set on the shelf. Everybody was building models of the Titanic, women too. So uh, 
uh, it became uh, a bit of a moneymaker. And I was actually able to quit my regular job and turn gold medal into a, into a, a full fledged uh, career. And so uh, every set I designed benefited from mistakes I had made on previous sets from lessons I had learned on previous sets. And I took a lot of my inspiration, especially in the instruction illustrations from the old Ravel and monogram instruction sheets. I used to love those. Uh, the early instruction sheets were nicely illustrated, lots of text to explain everything you needed to know. They did not leave you guessing, told you exactly where to put the glue, exactly how parts related to one another. And then they'd show you a quick little drawing of how everything's supposed to look like after it's assembled. So I took my inspiration from that and started drawing up my instruction sheets on a computer, of course, by this time. My early ones were hand drawn. But now uh, in the in the mid 90s, I transitioned over to Adobe Illustrator using a Macintosh computer. And uh, an IPMS member taught me how to use Adobe Illustrator. That was uh, the late, uh, uh, oh, what was his name? My mind is failing me. Uh, uh, Jones, uh, Lloyd Jones. Okay. The late Lloyd Jones used to work for Ravel back in the 1950s and early 60s. Then he branched out and became a decal manufacturer and uh, served numerous companies by making decals. So uh, he showed me how to use Adobe Illustrator and then I just uh, went out from there. I just expanded on that. And so eventually I got into the other scales. Uh, besides 350 and 700, I uh, decided to expand into the Airfix 1 600 scale. All of that was done by hand and an ink, but it wasn't, uh, I did that before I got into the computer age. I also did some 1 500 Japanese sets for the old Nichimo kits. Uh, same era, no no computer. And uh, then I got into 1-200 scale. By this time, I was into the computer age. So I added some 1-200 railing sets for the Nichimo big scale kits, the Ravel Olympia, uh, the uh, Glencoe kit of the Oregon. And then, then I went to an IPMS show, saw a lot of these wonderful kits being used with my etchings, and they were winning awards. These were other people winning awards. And uh, I just loved that. They were using my stuff and they were getting gold medals or the equivalent of. And that really just made me grin from ear to ear. They were actually feeling some of the glory that I felt. And I wanted to do more of this. So uh, to help more people get their awards and uh, just give them a good feeling and maybe uh, expand ship month. Well, ship modeling really started to blossom about this time. I don't know if I had that much to do with it, but uh, I would like to think I had a little bit influence on that because up until now, ship modeling was always a, a poor third to aircraft and uh, automotive modeling, and maybe a poor fourth if you count armor modeling. And once you have all those uh, people lined up, you might get a few ship models at the tail end uh, just picking around at the edges. And they never really amounted to much because ships are usually done at such small scales that getting fine, super detailing is really difficult. A lot of the guys were using techniques like stretch sprue, uh, thin wire. Uh, everybody's working under optivisors and uh, tweezers and so on and so forth. Very different from your uh, larger scale tanks and autos and aircraft. But when photo etching it came along, a lot of that fine work was done for them. All they had to do was glue the parts on. In some cases, fold them to shape. Well, I made the parts that I was designing easy to fold to shape by uh, including dotted lines, etched uh, slots that were really, really narrow so that once you folded, the slots closed up and they weren't very visible. Uh, but they were still enough to allow the part to fold exactly where it had to fold, and uh, the rest of the metal would stay untouched if you handled it the way you're supposed to. So little by little, I would come up with uh, ideas to make certain sets more easy to use than others, and I would promote them as uh, 
sets for newcomers. I uh, I try not to use the set uh, the term beginner, but uh, I would try to use the term like newcomers, people who are new to etching. And then uh, I'd recommend that they try some of these sets first before they went on to really involve set. I really involve an example would be uh, the Liberty ship set in one three fifty scale, or the uh, Japanese carrier Akagi set in one four fiftieth scale. I made special sets for those two, and they're both pretty involved. They uh, they take some effort to uh, make sure all the parts relate just right. You need to pay attention to the instructions, and uh, if you do that, you'll be okay. And apparently, it worked. Cause I have never received any complaints from anybody saying that I led them astray. I've always been complimented on the instructions. I don't get very many comments, uh, pro or con, but but uh, the majority of comments I get, in fact, almost all the comments I get, are in the nature of gratitude, in the nature of appreciation, in the nature of uh, uh, just thank you for making a nice set that works as well as it does. Everything fits. And they would compare me to other brands and it would be brands from this country, from other countries. And the people that would write these nice notes to me would say, you know, I've tried these other brands and they're okay. You've got to know what you're doing before you tackle them. But in, in the case of your brand, I always feel like you're leading me right down the path I need to go. And you're not going to let me go astray because if I read, and he's telling me, if I read your instructions, I won't make any mistakes. You've already made them for me, and you've told me how to avoid them. And I thought, well, that's nice. I and mean, actually, he's reading my mind. That's exactly what I was thinking as I was uh, coming up with all these designs. And so I had to uh, do some research to get my sets as, as accurate as possible because I now realized I was dealing with a clientele that was very knowledgeable in the subject matter that we were both working with. They knew the ships. They knew how they were equipped. They knew the radars that they were carrying. They knew what year the radars were installed and what year the radars were replaced. And so I had to get books and uh, references. And I started shopping around. I got a book from uh, Norman Friedman called Naval Radars. Not easy to find nowadays. And it gives photos and dimensions of every known naval radar from all the countries that have navies. And up to the point, I think it uh, was copyrighted in the late 1980s, early 90s. But it covered virtually all the plastic kits that I was designing parts for. And using references of this nature and many others like that, I was able to uh, get the detailing on the etchings exceptionally accurate. One other example would be the railing on the battleship Missouri. I uh, actually counted the stanchions, the vertical stanchions from the bow to amidships, and then duplicated that number on the etchings. And then another section of railing from amidships to the stern, and I did the same with that. That's going overboard. In the model railroad world, it's known as rivet counting. And that means that you're a fanatic you're obsessed almost to an unhealthy degree. Now, I'm not sure I want to know somebody like you, but I don't want to uh, get to the point that uh, uh, other people start feeling that way. I'm going to do that for them. I will be the weirdo. I will be the obsessed person, and they will benefit from my experience. They will get the etchings that are exactly right. And if somebody says, I don't think you're really right, they'll be able to turn to the reference material that I include in the instructions and say, here's the proof. This is where you'll find the proof. He's provided it right here in a list of references. And, uh, and eventually that person that made the accusation will come back and say, you know, you're right. He did get it right. So uh, things like that uh, just made my day. It, it, was, it, was, uh, it wasn't sort of a yeah, 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 yeah type of a effect. It was just a, just a feeling of doing a job right and uh, not disappointing the customer. I hated the idea that in some way I might disappoint a customer. 
And some uh, people would say, boy, your etchings are so nice and easy to use. I wish you'd include this. I wish you'd include that. And uh, in some cases, they would ask for things that I thought would be almost unreasonable because I looked at some of the competition and I read the reviews of the competition. Uh, there were certain companies that would make etchings that would fit one ship and yet they would send you like six sheets of metal for a single kit. And some of the metal parts are minuscule. You can barely cut them off the, off the brass fret without losing them. And somebody coined the term the carpet monster long ago. And the carpet monster would swallow up anything that fell off the workbench, never to be seen again, uh, like a black hole. And uh, I thought, I don't think I want to go quite that far in my designs. I figure if you really have to squint and look underneath something and use a magnifying glass to see it, I don't think I want to go there. I'm going to leave that to somebody else because most of my customers, I don't think, care about that kind of stuff. And so that was my... Uh, that was my decision. I chose to become, let's say, the equivalent of the Chevrolet of the etchers rather than the Rolls Royce or the Bugattis. I'll let other people go for that market. That market is very small, very, very finicky. And that market does not lend itself to much in the way of repeat business because instead of building one or two or three models a year, they'll build one model every two or three years. <laughs> and I'm not going to make much money off you guys like that. So uh, my idea was to appeal to the largest mass of modelers, give them what they need, and maybe throw a few little bonus parts in there, very small parts for the really finicky guys, but not many. And uh, they'd be of a nature that if you left them off, most people would never notice. An example of that would be the triangular braces that go underneath the perforated catwalks of the 1350 scale Yorktown class aircraft carriers. That would be the Yorktown, the Hornet, and the Enterprise that uh, Trumpeter came out with. Now, uh, if you want to put those triangular braces underneath, you have to do it one by one. And there's scores and scores of them. And uh, it'll please the real rivet counters a must. If you don't want to put them on, most people will never know because you can only see them when you get under the model and look up. You won't see them under any other viewing conditions. Right. right. So uh, I just uh, included them. They didn't take up much space on the etchings. They took up a small sliver over in one corner of the brass fret that wasn't being used for anything else. So I threw them in there as a bonus and I included them in the instruction sheet. No complaints. Nobody's ever complained to me about it one way or the other. Nobody's ever thanked me for them, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> they're there. That was just an example. And then I also like to, I, I started throwing in, I, I kept thinking, how can I make these uh, sets more appealing as time goes on? So besides providing the basic parts for the ship, I throw a few other things in as bonuses. An example would be the 1350 scale Buckley England destroyer escort that Trumpet came out with. Or the, uh, uh, well, another example would be the gearing. This would be a better example, the USS gearing that Dragon came out with. I included a little rack of mops and brooms that goes on the bulkhead. And this is something that every Navy ship has. No, no plastic kit has ever included, to my knowledge. Uh, but I went ahead and added that as a, as a bonus. And then I started including historic naval figures as part of the set's uh, accessories. For example, a captain of an aircraft carrier uh, would be, a, oh, uh, say, Bull Halsey. I'd have a figure representing him. It could be anybody. You can't really tell who it is. Right. But you right. can tell it's a Navy officer by the shape of his hat, his outfit, that's all etched in, right down to the wrinkles in the clothes. But you can't see any facial details. I would just name them that, though. And who's going to prove me wrong? But it was just a, an interesting bit. The idea was to excite the modeler and to start looking up the history of these ships and to uh, create a bond 
between the history of the United States Navy and the modeler. That might not otherwise be there. We want to know who the man was that collected all these ships led us to victory in World War II. How did he grow up? How did he become the leader that he turned out to be, commanding this huge aircraft carrier that I'm building a model of? And so they go into the library, dig out the history books, look things up online, and that might spark an interest where they would start building other ships and uh, just become more familiar with uh, the history of the, U of the United States Navy or the Air Force or the Army, any other branch of the military. So, but in my case, I concentrated mostly on the Navy because that's where the ships were and the Coast Guard. So, uh, but this, this is how uh, gold medal models came to be. Now, when I met my uh, girlfriend, who's now my wife, she liked trains. She, for some reason, she was always fascinated by trains. She didn't build model trains, but she just liked trains. And she saw what I was doing for the ship models. She asked me, why don't you do something for model train people? And she says, I'm sure they would like this kind of material, this kind of detail. And she planted a seed in my brain that began to grow. And I thought, you know, I think I'm going to uh, look into the uh, end scale field because the smaller the scale, the better photo etching matches. So I decided to look up a local end scale railroad club. This is when I was in California. And I joined the club and started uh, watching what they do, what they needed, went to local hobby shops. And then I came up with an idea to do a dozen sets to begin with. So I came up with the idea of chain link fence, fire escapes, TV antennas, and a few other little odds and ends that they could decorate their layouts with. And I brought those out, introduced them all in one shot, took out a full page ad in one of the model train magazines showing built up city streets with the fire escapes, burglar bars, Venetian blinds, all these photo etch details. And boy, did the order start coming in right off the bat, including from dealers. They wanted to know how they could get on my list to start supplying them with parts. And Walters contacted me. And here this little idea my girlfriend gives me turns into a, a whole new side in my business. So I began uh, developing the N-scale photo etching line. And right now, to this day, it's up to 67 different products. And I've still got that line. I'm still running that line. Not for too much longer, but for now, it's it's fine. It gives us a little bit of an income. And eventually, I'll be uh, uh, letting that one go, maybe, to you, Brandon. Uh, we'll see how that goes. And that pretty much covers uh, uh, gold medal models. You know, I'm, I'm like I said a little while ago, I'm 75 years old now. I'm in terrible health. I've got a lung condition that just is not going to be cured. And so I know that uh, I'm uh, approaching my sell-by date. And that's why I decided I better let the, uh, let the business go to a younger, more enthusiastic individual that can continue to operate it and maybe build upon it. Well, ever since uh, we made our arrangement and our deal, I've had countless emails and phone calls and you you were a big part of a lot of guys model collections i got I'm looking at this one email and i don't want to leave anybody out because you've helped so many people build nice models but this one guy in particular i talked to him today actually i don't know if you remember a guy named michael sharp he built yes. one of your models he won the uh he won the 1999 ipms best ship and this is something that I didn't know existed until he showed me a picture of it. And I'm going to pop it up on the screen here. He said, you gave this to him for winning with his ship. The wristwatch, yeah. <laughs> right. Where did that come from? How many of those are out there uh, floating around that I never knew about? <laughs> My wife and I, when we were at the height of gold medal models popularity back in the early 2000s, I think it was. Yeah. We got a bug in our, well, we got a bug to 
come up with promotional items like you see at various trade shows. And uh, we came up with gold medal model t-shirts. I still have a bunch of those here. Came up with gold medal models hoodies. And then I can't, and then I got a, I think it was a pamphlet in the mail from a trade show supplier offering wristwatches with company logos. And so they were reasonably priced. So I ordered, uh, I think, two dozen of them. And uh, we give them out to prize winners at the uh, IPMS shows. Whenever they won a, a first place, uh, right alongside their trophy, there was a gold medal models wristwatch. Okay. And that, that really tickled them. Boy, did they never expect that. It was just yeah. a cheap watch. It was nothing to do. It was a Timex <laughs> or whatever. But still, it had the gold logo, and yep. they just loved it. Well, Mike says he still wears that watch to every contest that he goes to. So uh, you certainly made an impression on him. And like it's I said, so, yeah, it's, so many people just like him have been sending emails just talking about how thankful they were of the products that you've created throughout the years. And, um, you know, so I'm just letting you know, you, nobody, uh, nobody could build a better ship without your stuff. So, uh, I think everybody's excited to see that the line will continue. Uh, I think a lot of people were hoarding your stuff over the last few weeks after they, uh, after they weren't sure if they were going to be able to get it anymore. So, and, you, you would you would probably laugh if you saw some of the pictures customers are emailing me of their stash of gold medal, kind of like this one. And I've gotten countless pictures like this of people just sending pictures and said, look at all the gold medal I've got. So everybody loves your stuff, Lauren. They really do. Um, so we're, we're very excited to be able to continue the line. Um, like I've told you, and I've, I've answered the question several times, we don't intend to change anything. When you order gold medal going forward, it's still going to come in the little envelope. Um, uh, I think the way that you've always done things is really good. and There's no need to fix something that's not broken. Your stuff is certainly not broken at all. Brandon, I can't thank you enough. Uh, you're, you're, you're doing me a favor. You're doing the ship models a real service. By keeping this thing going, I mean, it would actually be a shame to to see this uh, product line just disappear forever, because it's serviceable. It works fine, and uh, it'd be like seeing Chevrolet disappear into the into the midst of time. People are going to miss it. They're going to write about it. They may not write songs about gold medal models like they do Chevrolet, <laughs> but uh, who knows? Thank you for doing what you're doing, Brandon. Oh, absolutely, Lauren, and uh, we, we look forward to it, and uh, I know that you'll be around, and we'll probably be talking more now than uh, we ever have, so name uh, and, uh, we're going to be at the IPMS Nationals next week, and uh, a lot of your stuff has already arrived here, and we're planning on showcasing that at the show um, and letting a lot of people that perhaps have not seen it uh, in person in quite some time or ever. Uh, they'll be able to take a look at some of your photo etch friends next week. So that'll be nice. I'll be with you in spirit. There you so, go. Uh, have fun for me too. I'll do it, Lauren. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we'll speak again soon. Okay, Brandon. You take I care. Yes, sir. Me also. I'll do it, buddy. Thank you.